going off topic. Off topic? You really off topic right now. Yo, you way off topic. How is it that everybody's over here and you way over there off topic? All right, what's going on, family? Welcome to another episode of Going Off Topic with Brother Omowale. And as soon as we start the show today, my glasses want to start to fog up. It's because I've been uh, on my health and wellness journey. Went out, went out today to get a solar solar powered run. <laughs> this morning here on the East Coast, we actually have pretty pretty beautiful weather. So I went outside to the trail to get a quick run in. My first time running. I'm getting my lungs opened back up since this mm. Omarion situation impacted my body. <laughs> that that actually sounds kind of crazy. Since the the, the Omicron COVID nineteen situation impacted right. my body, so let me let me correct that because uh, to the uninitiated ear, they might take it the wrong way. But I have a very very special guest on the show today. We have uh, Doctor Siri McDougal the third, and whenever. I have an esteemed scholar uh, visiting with us on the Going Off Topic podcast. I like to start by reading their bio just to introduce them properly. So I'll get started. Uh, Dr. McDougal, Dr. Sarah McDougal III received his BS in sociology from Loris College in Dubuque, Iowa. Additionally, he has an MA in Africana Studies from the State University of New York at Albany and a PhD in African American Studies from Temple University in Philadelphia, PA. Sarah McDougal is also the co director of the Afrometrics Research Institute. His research interests span five basic areas one, Black fatherhood, two, Black manhood studies. Three, research methods and theorization in the discipline of Africana studies. Four, African and African-American politics. And five, Black student engagement. In 2017, Dr. McDougall was honored by the National Association for Ethnic Studies, who awarded him the Robert L. Perry Mentoring Award. He is the author of the book, Research Methods in Africana Studies, which received the National Council of Black Studies Ida B. Wells Sheikh Antijope Award for Outstanding Scholarship in 2016 and the Sheikh Antijope Institute for Scholarly Advancements, Excellence and Scholarship Book of the Year Award in 2015. Uh, Dr. McDougall is also the author of Black Men's Studies, a phenomenal work that was released in 2019. Dr. McDougall, welcome to the show. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You, 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 do, do you enjoy the reading of your bio? <laughs> no, no. I, I like. I was. I was gonna say. I like that. The the uh. You had the audio. Uh, the oh. appla- the applause. Yeah, yeah. You know, that was pretty cool. Yeah, you no. Know, I tell people we got a little bit of a budget over here. You know, I feel like if we're gonna do media for black people, we got to make the investments. You know, so. You know, black people invest their time and the content. So we want to make sure that our audience appreciates, you know what I mean, uh, the platform. Hold on one second. I'll give you another one. Talk your shit, uh, Professor I'm a wallet. I hope that your ears are not uh, sensitive. <laughs> Apologize for that. Shout out no, to me, me Jana, really quick. If you just pulling up for the first time. Yo, check this out. Run my uncle and well, his like. Make sure y'all go ahead and hit that like button. Subscribe to the channel. We about to get into a good conversation. So, so brother it. Siri, Doctor McDougal, how are you today? I'm doing well. Uh, really appreciate the invitation. It's an honor to be no, here. Absolutely, I absolutely. On too. absolutely. Um, I'm actually feeling better. Too. Oh yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, I, I bounce back pretty quick. I ch- I try to keep a, a regular kind of like health regimen going around the clock so and and chances when my you know times when my body breaks down i typically bounce back pretty quick as long as i give myself rest and you know vitamins and herbs things of that nature so yes sir try to stay charged up the right way but um yeah i actually i saw you for the first time you were on dr oba to shaka show and y'all had a brilliant discussion on black manhood that i really really uh, enjoyed. And then more recently, uh, you did an interview with my brother, uh, Black Panther, over at the um, Maasai Warrior Clan. Yes, definitely. He brought you on for an interview as well. So so I'm, I'm fortunate. I'm, I'm actually quite thankful to have you on the show today. So uh, let's get right into it. Um, I was telling you kind of behind the scenes, the way that we typically structure these going off topic conversations is I like to um, get to know a little bit about who you are just as a person, 
as a content creator, a scholar, an author. Um, and then the second part of the conversation, we kind of uh, dive into your scholarship. So I guess we'll start there. Who is uh, Dr. McDougal? I know I think you were born in Chicago. So let's take take me back to the beginning and then and, and walk me up to how you got to be Dr. McDougal. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> wow. Um, I guess I'm uh, um, um, I'm Ann and Siri's son. You know, uh, grandson to Siri. Senior, I mean, yeah, Siri Senior and uh, uh, Will Ellis, grandson to uh, Louise Ellis and Helen Floyd, and uh, born in Chicago on the south side of Chicago. That's um, that's where I came from and nurtured there, and just learned everything. I, I mean, I guess that's where everything that's about me that has served me well came from that experience okay. growing up on the south side of Chicago and my family, my sister, cousins. Got you. Got you. Are you familiar with Dr. Kamal Rashid at all? Nope. Okay. Cause he, he's a, a really good brother. I have a great relationship with him, but he's uh, in Chicago. I don't know if he's on the south uh, uh, side of Chicago, but um, he came up under uh, Dr. Jacob Carruthers, the Comedic oh. Institute out there in Chicago. So really good brother. Um, I, I imagine we're all around uh, the the same age. I don't, I don't mind disclosing. I just turned 38 uh, about yeah. a, week, a week or two ago. So I think that we are in the same age bracket. Yep. I'm a, I'm a few years older. Okay. But yep. All right. Cool. Jacob cool. Carruthers, I, Dr. Tish, when I was, um, when I first started to learn about, Jacob Carruthers, it was after I had met Jacob Carruthers. Oh wow. I didn't really know who he who he was. But my um my mother took me to what was then called the Center for Inner City Studies in, in South Side of Chicago to take um Medu Netter classes as a child. Yeah. And you know, they would he's got older guys in there, they were teaching, and it turns out. It was uh, Jacob Carruthers and Anderson Thompson. Wow. And it was only when I was in like master's program and I started to read about it. It's like, I know these, I know them, but yeah. So, so you, you were, you, your parents were, were relatively conscious. They were. Yeah. Yeah, they were. I mean, I never thought of them that way when I was growing up, but I think looking back, they definitely had like a, a, ra- a race conscious, political consciousness. That's that's a, that's a beautiful thing. Were, were you like an only child? No, I had I have a sister, an older sister. Okay, okay. So I mean, if 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 you were going to meta nature class as a child, I, I imagine the Afrocentric movement in some way, shape, or form had to make an impression on your parents for them to see that as important. You know, who go who goes out of their way to put their child into meta, meta nature classes without no. understanding the importance of it? It's interesting the way it's worked is they they treat me like um, they disclose information to me every like five years almost you yeah, know yeah and so I learned stuff that my parents were involved in I have I've learned stuff that they were involved in as an adult I had no idea about when I was younger you know yeah. when I was even a teenager they just decide like okay I think it I think he's ready to know you yeah. know. Like Hebrew Israel, like involving with the Hebrew Israelites and Black Panther Party. I'm like, wow, are you are you all serious? You never told me any of this. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, I had uh Dr. Tiasan Johnson on the show, and uh one of the things that he recommends that that we do, um, you know, as Gen Xers or geriatric millennials, is that uh we sit down with our parents and record them, get to know their story and and I was telling him um my grandmother passed in 2020 uh actually in 2021 uh she passed February of 20 and 20 February 2021 wow so this time last year she passed at the age of 93 uh due to covid um but in 2019 pre covid it was kind of sp- uh, put on my spirit to go and sit with her and record mm-hmm. her her life story just 
you know, pulled out the audio recorder and just started talking to my grandma, you know, a, a, about her life, you know, being raised in, in Alabama, being one of 17 children, uh, coming north in the great migration to Ohio, uh, leaving her entire family to move to Philadelphia uh, with my grandfather because uh, Ma Bell, which was the phone company at the time, had started a new, uh, I guess, factory or office in the Philadelphia area. So my grandfather and my grandma uh, moved down to Philly. And my grandma is the only one of her 17 brothers and sisters who left Ohio and and came to Philly. So it's like that almost like severed some of the connection, which my mom is presently reconnecting. But just sitting with her and learning about her childhood and her beating up a white boy for calling her nigger, you know, uh, the the pet pig that they had that unfortunately one day they, they had to eat, you know what I mean? So it's just like learning her. It was just such a such a, a beautiful thing. So I, I say all that to say I would encourage all of us to do the same with our parents or our grandparents if they are still living. Just sit down and record their stories, you know, before we we don't want to lose them to history. So, so that's important. Yeah, absolutely, that is so cool. I. There's so many, all of us have these amazing stories that they could be movies about when we when we learn about them. We, you sit down and listen to an elder and they tell those stories. I did the exact same thing that you just did. Um, mm-hmm. Recently with my mom, I had my mom out with my, um, we sat down with my wife and I recorded her telling the stories that she, she usually tells, you know, stories she's told so many times but had her sit down and, and tell those stories, just like the ones you just talked about. Yeah. 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 Do, you, it, do, you, oh, do you know your family's migration pattern here in the States? Yeah. Uh, Mississippi. Is, I, I was going to assume that because you Chicago. Yeah. So I was going to assume Mississippi, but go ahead. You can, absolutely. You can. Absolutely. Holly Springs. Um, Yazoo city, <clears throat> excuse me. Yazoo city, Mississippi. And, um, I think also Memphis and Florida. Okay. Okay. And then some, I'm sure somebody's listening. Somebody would be looking like, no, but I hope I didn't. I know I missed something, but definitely the one I know for sure is, um, is Yasu city, Mississippi. Yeah. No, it's a, you know, uh, the, 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 our, the black family here in the United States and our, our movement talking about our physical movement. It's just the story and our narrative is a very, uh, uh, a, beautiful thing. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's, it's also for me, it's a great, you know, source of pride to, to learn about it. You know what I mean? And to appreciate it and to understand, you know, all that we had to go through, even for me to be here. You know what I mean? I think that sometimes it's like, you know, we we understand that our family survived the transit, the, 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 the ship ride across the the, the Atlantic. So we understand that, but like our family survived the Maafa, right. And enslavement. You understand what I'm saying? So because of that, my, my son and my daughters, my daughters are alive today because I come from stock that, that survived that horrific um, institution. You know what I mean? And I think that I feel like sometimes within this generation, we just lack an appreciation for those stories and, you know, the the richness and culture that was developed and curated during that period. You know, what, what are your thoughts on that? I think you're absolutely right. We get the horrific part, you know, taught in great detail, the horrific aspect. But with that, because, you know, we're here, like you said, there's also a lot of heroism you know, and triumph. And that part, I think we don't get enough of. Yeah. It's right there in our own families. If we, if we look, you know, if yeah. we ask the questions and we listen to the stories, you hear about the, these great things that people did. Um, and I mean, going to Chicago, you listen to people from Chicago about the stories that they, that, that led to their family being in Chicago I mean, it's a, a lot of them that could be movies written about. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, what, what do you, you know, I, I, I was listening to you and Dr. Obatashaka speak, right? And um, 
I, I launched a podcast back in August of 2021 called Race, Manhood, and Power. But before I um came up with that name, I had like a list of like 50 names. And one of the names that I was going to call the uh, podcast, I think it was either going to be like Under Duress or Manhood Under Duress. And when I was listening to y'all speak and, you know, y'all were having a conversation about uh, the assault on the black family and on black fatherhood. And you mentioned how, you know, black men still fathered, even though it was like under duress. And like that really um, uh, spoke to me because because of the situation, I mean, we, we presently find ourselves in. But do you, do you want to unpack that just a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. And then, I mean, also, peace to Dr. Chishaka, uh one of the greatest philosophers, I think, of our time, specifically on African-Americans and a mentor, one of the best in-class teachers I've ever seen, too. Um, I spent my first year, I, w- I just sat in on Dr. Tashaka's classes to watch him teach, you know, so... But like, uh, as far as like the question, I think, I think, um, so black men, black men brought with them their own notions of manhood, their notions of fatherhood. And I think the, the thing that goes underappreciated is the fact that they never stopped. You know, they never stopped fathering. They never stopped being providers, um, nurturers and protectors. Um, even though they did so, and, you know, to use the language that you used under duress, you know, they did it. They had to be ingenious. They had to be creative in the ways that they did it. And so much of the politics, the the escapes, the rebellions, family, there was a backdrop of family that played a role in that. I mean, we see the, 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 the film um, on Nat Turner, you know, and read about Nat Turner and you know, thankfully the film was made and people got really excited about like the conversation. But one thing that is important to know about Black Nat Turner is that his wife was sold away. You know, a lot of times when people escaped, they were trying to reconnect with family. And and one of the things that really radicalized a lot of people was was matters related to family. Black fathers would they would sneak from plantation to another plantation to spend time with their children even at risk of being uh, beaten, you know? And they they took all kinds of covert measures and overt measures to protect their wives, to, uh, to, take the, to teach their sons how to hunt, um, to, to spend time with their daughters. And they did so at, you know, at, at risk of death. Yeah. And I, I don't think that goes un- appreciated enough. What you hear a lot about is how they were unable to father or they were taken out of their father- fatherly role. And again, that, that never happened. Yeah. that You know, w- one of the things that really bothers me about the way we um, study black people, and I use the term we loosely because I'm not in the academy. Right. But when I, when I, the way that some folks within the academy study black people is from such a detached um, method. You understand what I'm saying? And and I I know the the, the academy uh, you know it preaches the so called uh, efficacy of being objective, like when you're studying you know a, a subject. But I just feel like some of these stories. Uh, and narratives that we write about ourselves, even when it's coming from Black people, I'm like, ha- have you actually ever met Black people? Like, you, you're writing as you have not lived among us, you know what I mean? And it's like, it's it, it just bothers me sometimes because it's like we, I don't know, it's almost like we're like suspended in space and we're writing about this abstract thing. And it's like, no, these were people who were striving to maintain their humanity and dignity like that was never taken away from us which is why I, I appreciate some of the corrections that the afrocentric movement sought to make like we weren't slaves we were enslaved people right putting the focus back on our humanity and that humanity means that we still had agency we still had will 
You understand what I'm saying? Like we still like we we resisted. Like we never just like we never just threw away our culture and just became this object to be made into whatever the slave society desired us to be. Like no, we were African people under conditions of duress. And I mean, by to to an extent, not even to an extent, by extension, we still are living and maintaining under duress. But you, you care to speak to that to that at all? Absolutely. I just got through talking to my students this past week about using the language of uh, slave and enslaved and why we use enslaved. Um, and we talked about uh, we talked about Fort Mose, like the history of Fort Mose in uh, in St. Augustine, Florida. You had a group of um, formerly enslaved African people who had a community and agreement with the Spanish that they would defend the Spanish Florida territory against the English. But what they also used that base for was to do raids. They would periodically raid plantations and free black people and bring them back. Yeah. And they would periodically kill um, English enslavers and patrollers and free more black people. And they became a threat, you know, to the, to the English and, the students, when they hear, they hear the the suffering part, but then they also hear the resistance part. It's more holistic, and it, it allows them to appreciate to appreciate the experience and connect with it, and and be proud of it more because they're getting the whole picture. They're not yeah. just getting what was done to black people. Well, you know, I'm I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, the situation there, you know, the, the, the first time I had ever read about Fort Mose um, was in a book called Lies My Teacher Told Me. I don't know if you're familiar with that book. Yes. OK, yeah. So that's the first time I ever read about it. And um, and that same chapter is where he was talking about the Seminoles and basically, you know, the Seminoles actually being a bastardization of the word Cimarron, which is a Spanish, a Spanish word that just simply means uh, a runaway that has been bastardized throughout the diaspora. So down in the Bahamas or in the Jamaica, Jamaica, you might get the Maroons. Well, I mean, we had a, a serious Maroon tradition right here in the United States. But one of the challenges that we face in this uh, in this generation is the minds of our young people are under significant attack from dis and misinformation. Like people who take partial facts and partial truths of the story to completely rewrite the narrative to suit a particular objective. For an example, there is an entire movement of black people um, online now who believe that they were actually the Native Americans um, in this country. And then, so they'll take the story of the Africans um, from, from Fort Mose and say, those were actually indigenous black people who were native uh, to, this, to this country. They weren't Africans, right? So they'll take those stories and use them to rewrite this narrative where it's like, we as black people were always in this country. We didn't come here on slave ships. So I, I don't know if you've seen any of that online, but it's pretty pervasive. I've been hearing a little bit about it. I've had a, sometimes people, I've had a couple of people ask me about this. And um, so I'm not, not familiar with it, but it's, it's, it's growing. It sounds like. Yeah. Growing, growing rapidly. I mean, and I mean the tentacles of it for, for a while, I have been trying to come up with an umbrella to capture the different aspects of this movement because I mean, it definitely stretches. It stretches back, but I, you know, if we want to go back into the 19th and 20th century, we see elements of this kind of like thought process. But the larger umbrella term that I say it is that I refer to these movements as lost tribe identitarian movements. So some of the core elements, in my opinion, is that they are both anti-African and anti-intellectual, but also ahistorical, and a lot of their mm projection right so the lost tribe thing just means that we as black people are just a suspended group with no attachment to any history right so, and and the the identitarian piece becomes they look for an identity where they can wed blackness to americanness and disassociated uh blackness mm -hmm. with 
with Africanness, and it's a huge movement. I mean, you see it express. You talked about the Hebrew Israelites, of which my father came through that school of thought as well. You know what I mean? So you see it. You see you see it manifested in these different groups. And now you have a huge group of Black Native Americans online. You know who call themselves the Aboriginal of this land, and it's like it's dangerous because they'll take artifacts or p- pieces of evidence that some Afrocentric scholars may have, like, for example, you know, um, uh, uh, Dr. Ivan Ben Sertimer, they came before Columbus. So they'll take a piece from his writing and then use that to weave an entire narrative that is completely detached from facts. It's like they jump from here, skip over all evidence and cherry pick, you know, conveniently to yeah. build this narrative that is just destroying the minds of our of our young people. So, I mean, I'll, I'll send you some stuff then if you haven't if you haven't seen. Yeah, send me some stuff. I say put the put the evidence on the table. It's it's if you got a if you got a hypothesis, there's nothing wrong with having a hypothesis. But at the end of the day, if you can't show the evidence trail. All right, all right. So I see you 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 did your undergrad. You got a BS in sociology, uh, and then for grad school, you got an MA. And Africana studies, and you came here to Philly to get your your PhD, uh, and 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 to, uh, and African American studies. Like, how, how was how was that experience for you? And what 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 inspired you to even go into that direction? To the direction of like Africana studies, yeah, uh, and uh, yeah. studies. So when I was in Dubuque, Iowa, a small town in Iowa. I went to a small school by the name of Loris College. It was like, at the time, maybe 1,500, 1,600 students and perhaps like 30-something Black students on campus at the top, top, highest number. Um, So what that did was it made us a really tight-knit group and we became really demanding on campus. We started like a Black culture house and... Black student organization, we traveled to conference from conference to conference, and we were trying to get more information about Black people on campus taught in in the classes. So we ended up getting it off campus. And so I became really interested in, like, I mean, I went to go see speakers, see Dr. Francis Cress Wilson speak, Steve Coakley speak, uh, all different speakers at different black student conferences around the entire country. And um, that w- that's what made me interested in it. And I was a sociology and history major and I wanted to go to graduate school in uh, some form of black studies. So that's what took me to, that's what got me interested in the discipline. Got you. Got you. So yes. in terms of, in terms of uh, those black scholars who kind of influence your trajectory uh who who would you say uh they are wow um i mean it was it definitely started with steve coakley he was a he's a, a researcher and i was very inspired by him to do research um then after that i mean of course like reading dr dr uh dr ben um francis Cress welsing I mean, that just started me down the road of Shake Onto Job. And I met uh, Dr. A.J. Stovall, who was at a uh, um, school in Holly Spring, Russ College. And he he introduced me to Chancellor Williams, mm-hmm. Walter Rodney, Franz Fanon. And we even went on a study abroad in Gambia and like studied these thinkers in on the African continent. I mean, that really like changed my thinking, my yeah. thought process. And so ultimately, I mean, the, the ones that I, it's, it's Wade Nobles and Kobe Kanban, these two I hold in really high, high esteem, those particular two. Yeah. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. What, what, what was it like studying, studying at Temple? What, what years were you at Temple for your PhD? 2003 to 2007. Okay. Oh, studying at Temple. You did ask me, what was it like being at Temple? Philly. I mean, Philly itself is just one of the most 
politically conscious. I don't know if it's because of the recent, like the more Philly has a lot of places point to the sixties for like these really like overt state attacks and political content. Phillies is more recent. And I just think that there's a unique, there's no other political consciousness that's quite like Philadelphia's. Yeah. You know, it yeah. is, uh, yeah. No, I guess, I mean, it's definitely, um, it's a special, it's a special place, you know what I mean? To, to, to come into consciousness uh, for sure. Especially like even being here, like I'm, I'm still, learning things about not just the history of, of black people here, but the history of the movement here. You know oh, what wow. I mean? And and the different personalities that were based here is like wow, like and and I'm I'm 38. You know what I mean? I still I st- I'm I'm pretty sure there's a fair amount of information that I still don't know, but it's definitely as 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 one of those places that I feel uh very fortunate um to be attached to and to have as a part of my story you know what i mean and and just to, as a part of my growth and my trajectory like philly has definitely um you know shaped me a lot and given me a unique outlook on life you know because i i grew up in the shadows of uh, temple university you know what i mean like literally the zip code um 19133 it's the poorest zip code in the city of Philadelphia to this day. You understand what I'm saying? So growing up in that environment and just, you know, once I started to, to obtain education, both formal, but then also my own um, self-study, it gave me the ability to have a lens to understand what I had saw, what had been done and is being done to my people that really just, you know, I'm not going to say it radicalized me, but it, you know, it, it pushed me down this pathway of wanting to know more. And that started with listening to, you know, lectures and listening to speeches. And I'm, I'm, I'm very thankful because my trajectory was really interesting. You know, like, I think the first thing that I did, you know, just from, it may have been like a Malcolm X reflex from from uh, from Spike Lee's movie Malcolm X. The first thing I did was, you know, I took my Shahada. You know what I mean? I, I con- converted to Islam, and that you know, reading Islamic texts, but also um, reading texts of the time, and you know, the decade before I like came into consciousness, like conspiracy information was really big. I mean, you talked about um, you talked about you know Steve. Bob with Steve Coakley, but like, I mean, the, the first conspiracy book I picked up was like Behold a Pale Horse. And then that takes you down a journey and you start like just moving and moving and learning and your mind is expanding. But eventually I was blessed to kind of, I landed on Malcolm, then I landed on Amos and Amos started to bring me closer and closer to those African centered scholars and those Afrocentric scholars. And they just put all of the pieces of the puzzle together for me, like help me to understand this. And they pointed me in the direction of who to read. Like you start talking about Fanon and folks like that. Like that was my, you know, experience. So now like traveling this journey, I'm still, I'm still learning, but at this point it's not just analysis for me. It really is practice as well, but I, we exist within a different framework in the movement right now. So I don't, I don't want to go, too far off on a tangent, but I just wanted to hear your story because these things always, always fascinate me. So, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mm-hmm. I feel the same way. You know, I went from 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 uh, Brother Coakley to um, Doctor Stovall, and then on to you know my my research methods teachers at a uh, at Temple University that really tightened me up, and uh, and like you said. If there's anything I'm I'm learning now, it's how much I don't know. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Did you have any classes with like Dr. Mazama and Dr. Asante when you were here? I did, I did, and I mean, so Dr. Asante, of course, I mean, just his him as a there's his classes, but then there's just him as a model of work, like work ethic and uh, vision, and advancing the discipline, and then. I mean, Dr. Mazama, I mean, her, 
operationalizing Afrocentricity. I haven't seen it done that way by by anybody. She's uh, yeah, she's she's incredible. Yeah, yeah. No, she's 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 a, a mentor to me, a, a spiritual mother for me. Like she's she's a very very serious individual. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Like very, very serious individual. All right, let's let's get into some some of your scholarship here, right? So, uh, uh, black fatherhood uh, and black manhood studies is what I first uh, kind of you know came came in touch with you on in your conversation with uh, Dr. Oba Tashaka. So, like, what 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 made you want to kind of like specialize in those focus areas? Yeah, I think black fatherhood is. The reason I wanted to to talk about that is because of what I've read, like what I saw about black fathers. It didn't seem to line, like so much of what's written about black males. It doesn't seem to line up with the lived reality. You know, there's a distance between what's written about black males and like what actual black males live out on a yeah. day <laughs> on a day to day basis, and like this idea of absence or fatherless, these kind of uh, terms that, that again, they don't represent Black children's uh, realities accurately and definitely not Black fathers. And so I felt there was a big gap there when it came to fathers who were um, non-biological. I said this is as good a place to start as any, the fact that there's not so much written about uh, non-biological fathers or social fathers, as they're called, which you know, they can also be a biological, they may be a, a uncle or a cousin that takes on parental responsibilities, but also mothers, romantic partners, um, neighbors, coaches, uh, pastors, et cetera, who play a uh, father role, school principals, et cetera. Yeah, no, I appreciated that when I heard you speaking about it with Dr. Obatashaka, you talk, there's a significant amount of fathering that is happening in the black community but because we don't understand or appreciate the African black family kinship network and the way our family is flexible, given the environment and fathering under duress is like we completely discount the amount of fathering that is presently happening in our community. It goes right back to what you were talking about at the beginning about um, fathering during enslavement, you know. Um, the same thing all the way up into the present moment. And these these men are invisible. You know, they're rendered, they're rendered invisible. Of course, they're visible, but they're ignored. Yeah. You know? what, what were some findings in your research on Black men and Black fathers that completely, like, shifted your paradigm in terms of how you understand us and, like, just, like, disrupted how how we've been, the story that's been told about us? Two things, two things. The one, the stories, like the actual stories, interviews with formerly enslaved black women um, and men about their fathers, like what their fathers meant to them, what their fathers did and like how their fathers were sold away. But before the, the messages they left their children before they were taken away. The messages that fathers told their sons: "Don't ever let anybody, um, don't don't let, let anybody ever hurt your mother. You know, look after your sister. Look after your the the messages from fathers that I'll be back. I'm not, you know, I'm not gone forever. I'm coming back for you all. The messages that black soldiers, male soldiers during the Civil War, wrote to their to their uh, to their their children's enslavers." writing like soldiers who, who were working for the Union Army send messages to their, the, um, the whites who were, were uh, holding their children saying, hey, I'm coming for my children. You know, I'm coming to get my children back. Messages to their, to their sons and daughters saying that I'm, I'll be there after, after uh, and not long, I'll be there, you know? to making sure that when they came to places like New Orleans or Louisiana, that they made sure that they went, I'm going to my children's, the plantation my children are on, and I'm going to free them. Yeah. You know? Those kind of messages run 
smack in the face of the messages that that are that you see in a lot of this so-called gender scholarship about how black males were were moved out of the role of provider protector during their during enslavement. It's just an egregious like misalignment with the lived reality of black males then and, and now. The same thing now. Yeah. You know, I've 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 read um narratives uh, about our ancestors who were enslaved and one thing that i think a lot of us don't appreciate is the amount of skilled labor that black men possess during enslavement i mean when you talk about like whether it's blacksmiths or you are upholstery or furniture creation some of these black men were so skilled that they were actually able to uh the, the the master would let them manage themselves right and and they would get a piece of the earnings and save those earnings up and purchase their freedom and not only purchase their freedom but then go and purchase the freedom of their wife and of their children and i mean it's it's the same thing today um uh, dr malana karenga says in order to free the people we have to first free their labor so a lot of us as men we don't want our wives to have to like work, you know, outside of the home. So it's like, how can I free my labor or make my labor um, so that I'm not giving it to a corporation, but I'm giving it to something that's creating value for me and my home so that I can get the wealth to then purchase my wife's labor. She doesn't have to go outside of the home and, you know, work here or work there. She can focus on nurturing uh, the the children and educating the children like I, like black fathers and black men really that's that's a big part of our tradition that just gets erased. Wow, I mean, brother Africa, you uh, you really anticipated what that was number two for me was going to be the economics part. Um, not really being e an economist in any of my research before this uh, book, it was a learning experience just to read what I had to read to write the economics chapter of the Black Male Studies book. And that's one of the things that, that stood out to me was the skilled labor. Like you said, the the blacksmiths, the carpenters, the um, the black males who, were, who worked aboard ships that were able to, like you said, earn money from being leased leased out and using that money to purchase their freedom of their families and them, themselves and their families, but also the systematic removal of black males from skilled labor as well, because yeah. the black males during segregation had started to become black morticians, black, uh, black educators, black lawyers, physicians, um, electricians, etc. But then the period just after the, the period um, where they're actually moved out systematically, they're no longer allowed to be trained electricians or engineers. They can be they can be the um, the porter. You know, they yeah. can no longer be the sheet metal workers or the, the um, blacksmiths. Instead, they could be the hotel doormen, the shoe shiners, et cetera. So I, I think it's underappreciated that black males were systematically removed from um, from skilled labor jobs. Yeah, there's an entire history of black porters um, and their and their organizing and right. kind of like what they meant to the movement. If you study the history of the UNIA and the way that black men who worked about abroad aboard ships, how they were able to carry the Negro world to the different locations where black people were, which was the newspaper of, of it, was, it was the uh, political organ of the Garvey movement to the point that certain colonies on the African continent, the punishment was death if you got caught with one of these newspapers because of the the rhetoric and the, you know, the politics that were held within those particular newspapers. But it was black men who were risking their lives, sneaking these newspapers to other populations of black people getting us organized with like we had that unofficial grapevine you know what i mean where information traveled based upon the 
black men who were porters on the trains and the black men who were working aboard aboard the ships. So it's like this, like just such a history that um, has been assaulted by this tradition of gender studies, which in my opinion is a very close appendage um, to the state in terms of how, you know, it's been systematically used to create counter narratives and alternative narratives that are meant to morally defeat us, you know, and to maintain a type of division between us where the idea of, 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 of a black man and leadership is looked at something that is morally wrong. You understand what I'm saying? Like today, when we talk about the politics of, of, of leadership, even within the movement, there is an entire generation of women that have been socialized and educated to believe that there is something morally wrong with black male leadership in particular heterosexual black male leadership. It's like, well, how do you, how do you fight and, 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 and wage a war of resistance when half of your forces have been manipulated into rejecting any type of direction or correction from the other half? I mean, I think you, you captured an uh, experience that is, um, that a lot of people can relate to hearing you hearing you describe it that way and it's just this it's a, it's a fight on multiple fronts and, and you even find out i mean how many how much different groups have in common with one another um i think just to more directly address what you're saying the issue is a is is an issue of like I think lack of balance in analysis. You know, it's it's definitely the effect of the ultimate effect of it is to destabilize black solidarity, the destabilization of black solidarity, and it doesn't have anything to do with like um, not willing, not being willing to talk about like issues of like uh, identity, sexual identity. Uh, or sexuality, which a lot of it, I think, is is framed around. It's just the unwillingness to tell the whole story yeah. of black men, and yeah. and it's not that they can't. It's not. It's not the inability to do it. It's the un. It's the lack of will to do it. You know, and yeah, like I mentioned, it just destabilizes black solidarity, and and that and it's that narrative shaping mentality. Whatever happened to just telling the truth? You know, what about what what about just sticking to the facts like you mentioned earlier? You know, what people ask me like, hey, did you write a book to try to uplift or uh, to write a positive book about black male? No. No, I'm not interested in writing. I, I mean, that might be the outcome. Who knows? You know, people might read it and, and feel uplifted. I would be happy to hear that. But no, I just I wanted to tell the whole story of black males yeah and black and i found that the black males who have read it have felt uplifted even though i talk it's you you know i I never thought about in terms of like just negative and positive but i cover negative and positive issues all throughout the whole thing but i think what they appreciate is having the whole story told and and it's about laying the facts on the table not shaping a narrative yeah, I mean, we've, I think that we have, um, as a community, um, and and particularly, th- there's a class of Black people that I refer to as ATMs, um, and I, basically what I mean by that is academically trained mercenaries. Wow. Like, they, they have um, been fed poison pills on college campus that are meant to destabilize us as a collective, destabilize our families, destabilize our movement. And because they have been indoctrinated with this information, they essentially function as agents of chaos and and disruption in all facets of, of, of Black life, our African life here in America, right? I, I think back to... Um, 
to um, post enslavement when Booker T. Washington is writing about up from slavery. Mm -hmm. And he's pointing out the fact that um, black uh, formerly enslaved people in this country have a control um, or a command over a significant portion of the labor skill set needed for the economy. So when he was saying, cast down your buckets where you are, he was essentially saying, we have all the ingredients needed to build. We just need to stop wasting our energy looking externally and turn internally to build up the group. And, you know, I think about men, you you were talking about um, the skill sets that we have. Um, I, I do a session on my, in the War College um, Institute that I'm developing for our community. Um, wow. And I do a session called um, Soapbox Sessions, sound only Patreon exclusives for the members of the War College. Um, and at the beginning of February, I did one on um, uh, Joseph C. Clark. He's the founder of Eatonville, Florida. Mm. Right. This is the first incorporated black town post enslavement. This is a former slave who purchases 20 acres of land and builds the first incorporated black town. And you just just think about all the skill sets and organization that you have to have to be able to organize and build a community. You understand what I'm saying? So it's like we exist in a situation now where (laughs) our people are being educated to reject that type of leadership. In fact, it's a bit more nefarious because the argument is made when black men say that, Hey, we want to build institutions that provide for our needs because we need to have uh, power and order to do the things we need to do for ourselves. That's turned around on us. And it's, and it's said to us, Oh, y'all just want to be the new white men. Y'all just want to replace white men. Y'all just want power because white men have power. And it's like, do you mean to tell me that you as a black woman, you desire to exist under the domination of of white men? Because what we're saying is as a collective, black men and black women, we have to organize and build our institutions for power. But I I do think that there has been this... um, I don't know. I don't let's call it destabilizing, right? The lack of balance that exists in our community that has made it so that there are a fair amount of, of, of black women who've been socialized to believe that black male leadership or direction or instru- instruction is an inconvenience that they should not have to uh, succumb to, if that makes any sense. Yeah, I think so. And again, if it's not. I mean, we, we can see it when it happens outside of our communities, uh, when it was the algorithms that were producing stories to divide the uh, the Democratic Party, you know, and it's exposed on the news and everybody understands that, oh, there were these fakes, these things that were, that were exaggerated, et cetera, that the purpose of it was to divide. <clears throat> the vote. But at the same time, even when that happened, our community was targeted specifically, you know, by those bots, those uh, those Russian bots. And when it's about us, it's it seems like there's a difficulty, not for everybody, but to under to recognize efforts at destabilization for what they are, you know. But again, I think once again, it's the it's having a balanced view that brings people together, and people still re- people respond to that. Like if you look at black, the way black profe- black males and black women, black uh, men and women are treated in the professional world. You know, um, I was reading a study not long ago about like um, how black males. Black males were more likely, I believe, the the study. I'll have to find it to uh, to give the the source to you. But the um, that black males were who were assertive at work were perceived more threat as more threatening, and um, compared to their black female counterparts when they were assertive. Yeah. However, when black males experienced some failure at work. 
um, and black women experienced some failure at work, the black women were were judged more harshly for yeah. failure. Now, if we take both of them, we can see our experience holistically, then we can appreciate, okay, we are both experiencing something. Here's how, how we experience it differently. Then we can appreciate. I think that, that that's, you can build solidarity out of that. But when you have a perspective that says, no, you're privileged and advantaged for being black and male and um that's the that's narrative shaping versus research you know yeah. and i think that this whole that there's a whole trend right now that it confuses narrative shaping with research yeah i mean narrative shaping is a tool of power let's i mean i, I don't think that we can we we can't fool ourselves into kind of like ignoring what certain things are right certain certain like if if you see yourself as locked in a competition for resources and in order to get those resources, you have to wield influence and power. Then it's not about presenting facts. It's about holding on to narratives that are profitable and that further. I think that we saw a lot more, more of that post-integration, right? Post-integration, you get a class of black men and black women who don't have any fidelity to the black race, but they realize that they could weaponize elements of their identity in order to negotiate and secure resources from the system. And I think that some of the ideology um, that was created, you know, assisted in that effort. Like for an example, um, you can't tell me that black men are privileged in some way, shape and form within this system and then within the same essay, because I'm referring to Kimberly Crenshaw's work where she first introduced the concept of intersectionality, literally within that, within that essay or that article, she writes that black, she writes white women benefit from whiteness, but their um, gender offsets any benefit, right? So how can you say that? And then when it comes to black men, not say, and not not be able to make the same articulation to say that black men benefit from maleness, but their race offsets, you know, any any true true privilege that they would have for maleness. It's like no, that 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 doesn't compute. You understand what I'm saying? It doesn't compute because it doesn't advance their narrative. And that's what it is. People are loyal to narratives, they aren't loyal to the truth. Right. Right. And I mean, if that were true. That it's not it, on in one on one hand it's not it's so false that it's not even worth worth engaging like it's uh if that were true then I mean that's the same that same combination has resulted in eighty plus percent of our people's lynchings being black males mm -hmm. you know it's 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 resulted in countless dead bodies of black males where where was the privilege yeah. You know, what happened to it? Where did it go? Yeah. You know, so it's a lack of nuance. What it, I think it is. Black males are complex and nuanced. Their experiences are complex and nuanced. And I think you see in a lot of gender scholarship, the suspension of nuance when it comes to black males. But, you know, the same people are capable of nuance because they 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 use it effectively when it's not about black males you know, lives. So again, it's that lack of uh, willingness to be balanced in, in that analysis. When I do my research, when I teach a research methods class right there, I tell people that my students, it's, no, it's nothing long, wrong with you having a perspective. You know, it's nothing wrong with you having a opinion, but you can't ignore one side of your argument. Like, you know, somebody writes a, a story about say black learning styles right or black students learning styles and i say well what i'm reading your paper but you haven't addressed the counter arguments to to your to what you said well why would i write about that dr mcdougall because that doesn't help me prove my point that's the problem <laughs> it's trying to prove a point yeah you should be trying to answer a question yeah. You know, so when I say when I say like the difference between narrative shaping and 
and research is not that I'm saying that you can't have a position or a, pr a perspective is that you have to, even if you have a position that you're, that you hold on to, you can't ignore half of an experience just for the, to sake uh, for the sake of proving the point that you want to prove. Yeah. Because what if you find out something that contradicts your, your view? Yeah. And that's what the cost is. Ignoring black males realities allows them to con to allows them to maintain a false reality because if yeah. they engaged it in a nuanced way it would humanize black males for them it would cause them to have to adjust their perspective and, and it's based so much on the narrative they've created that they're unwilling to look at the whole the whole uh the whole story yeah. i mean at, at this point the narrative gets you um appointments at foundations um you get directorships like you get, the narrative is so profitable at this point that like forget any inconvenient facts or truths like we're not going to introduce anything that's going to disrupt this money train you understand what i'm saying so there I do. there's a lot of economic benefit in keeping the narrative up let me let me let me ask you ask you this question um you write on uh, black fatherhood, black manhood. And when I started my podcast, um, Race, Manhood, and Power, I wanted to have a definition that I could use to engage the conversation around manhood. So I, I tried to create one that I felt could be flexible enough to allow men to grow into it you know what i mean and not necessarily so rigid but but uh, but also have all of the the attributes that in my mind truly speak to manhood which you know for me manhood is synonymous with like sovereignty in many ways right if you remove your someone's sovereignty it's like you're removing their, so their their manhood right so the definition i developed was um I said that manhood is a system of order, protection, and direction. Subsequent to the episode ending, I added correction. So manhood is a system of order, protection, direction, and correction that is expressed through institutions that are capable of meeting the vital needs of a group. Right? So in me shaping that definition, what I was trying to do is give us as black men an idea of the activity that men are supposed to engage in, right? Because it's not about us as individuals, but as a collective, as men, are we working to establish the institutions that provide food, clothing, shelter, and safety for the group? Because without those institutions, you can't really have sovereignty you can't have the protective barrier that manhood is meant to provide. And you could argue, well, do you really have manhood without those things? So that, that was my particular thesis. And I used that to engage the conversation all 17 episodes, but I'm asking you, do, do you have a definition that you use for, for manhood or black manhood to engage your scholarship? I think, um, I like the definition that you just gave, and uh, it's not the same. When I'm going to give a definition, but I think that it it fits with what you just said. the The way I define it is, I mean, drawing on um, Tyrone Howard, T. Elon Dancy, and uh, Wade Nobles, and and some others, is like that. Manhood is the principles, the values, the principles, the values, and um, beliefs associated with being black and male you know that you associate with being black with being with being male so that's more of a generic kind of a definition and i think that what you did was like you get this is these are the principles the principles are sovereignty you know and you went on so i mean i think that that's just that's a more specific definition of manhood but i i share the, the definition of manhood that I have is that one. I think it, I think it fits with the one that you just gave is a, is an actual, like a specific, uh, more specific definition of it. Um, and yeah, I think that, that, yeah, that's the way I, 
Okay, cool. Well, I have, I have uh, two more questions, and then I'll I'll leave you the floor so you can plug in anything that you want to plug. Um, tell folks whatever you felt. If it didn't come out in the conversation and you wanted it to, the floor will be yours to do so. But um, okay. so my second to last question is this. Um, how do I say this? So I know, I know you, you you wrote a chapter on black men in economics, right? We understand the sick sick the systemic di displacement of black men that has occurred as a result of policy, but also deindustrialization. And now with the advancement of automation, black men are rapidly being uh, pushed to the outskirts of society. I mean, I, I mean, this isn't necessarily new. Um, Sidney Wilhelm writes in 1960, who needs the Negro? You know, I mean, even Carter G. Woodson writes in 1933, in Miseducation of the Negro, he's, he's talking about the advancement of automation way back then and the impact that it's going to have on us. But I guess the question I'm going to have for you is, is there an existential crisis presently facing Black men in modern society? And if so, what do you think that we need to do as a group whether it be black men or as a collective, whether it be black men and black women um, to, to address this existential crisis facing black men. That's the first question I have. Wow. I think. I apologize for my pause. I'm thinking about that question. I said, really, I want to give that the seriousness that it, uh, it deserves. Okay, so I think this, I think that we have to create networks around black males. We already do this informally. Black males will create around them networks of people that are of like mind, that, that, uh, that see them, that provide affirmation, that see them as legitimate. Um, and reflect their values and we have to do that around black boys you know and black men do it informally we have to establish formal institutions and organizations that provide those basic needs um, of legitimacy and affirmation and and visibility to to black males to not just see themselves as to enhance like black psychology, the like one of the most researched to topics is racial identity. But we need to, uh, to create networks around black males that affirm their black manhood, not just their racial pride, their pride in themselves as both black and male at the same time. That part I think is, uh, that part I think is missing. And there's some things out there like there, there's some, there's some models of it and they show success, you know, whether it be like the Brothers of Ujima, like these, these rite of passage programs, et cetera, but more formal ones for adult males as well. And then I think the mentorship is, is critical for black males to have guidance, people who are gonna seek resources and opportunities for them because they can be on college campuses and if they don't have, if they're not people who are out there who are intentionally guiding, intentionally seeking resources for them, it makes it more difficult, especially now, you know, being 30 and 30% 30 of, of campuses and in different places. Um, other than that, I mean, I think we, not, we need to start paying attention to the intersection of race and gender when we look at politics, because we do need to advocate for, um, I mean, it's not enough to say invest in infrastructure and then you have low in, you know, less educated, low income males who are gonna benefit from that. Okay, we already know that. And we know that those jobs a lot of times are very short term and they don't last from one administration to the next. We, we need targeted programs, targeted investment in teaching black males STEM, you know, who, who have interest in STEM uh, professions, targeted investment in training, 
professional training for black males in in neighborhoods that are that have higher those higher levels of unemployment but we start we need to start taking the intersection of race and gender seriously when it comes to policy advocacy and single gendered uh schools i think as well yeah you know, even though they they face pushback from the women's political lobby often, or even yeah. the ACLU, we still need to continue to push to have that option. I'm not saying all of them need to be that. That option needs to be available to a black parent to be able to send their uh, their boy to a a single gender uh, school, not just single gender, but one that's that's centered. You know, that's African centered. Yeah. You know, so that's I think that's a part of it. And that's just a part. No, I, I appreciate that. Um, we have a, um, we started a collective. Um, talk about creating those formal networks, right? We started a collective last year called Cobra Calisthenics. Um, Cobra is an acronym, the Council of Black Restoration Activists, um, focusing on, I guess, chiefly restoring my eye, right? Restoring balance, but more broadly, uh, restoring. African manhood and African womanhood, uh, and we we engage it through the principles of siege warfare. So I I have this model um, that I developed uh, back in 2016 as a response to the black community being under siege, and I I created what I, what I refer to as the five F's of fortification. But I, I've since updated it; it's now six F's. But any community that is going to be fortified from a siege assault, <clears throat> you know, you have to build up the wall of family, faith, finances, fitness, food, because you got to be able to feed yourself. And the last one is facilitation. That's the educational component. There has to be a way of knowledge transfer and knowledge production so that people have the skill sets that we need to advance our own survival. So, we kind of like bake that idea into Cobra Calisthenics, which we see as a collective that's focused on building black men mentally, physically, spiritually. But the most important component is strengthening their character. Um, Iwa Pele. So yeah. that's that's what we do with Cobra Calisthenics. We started it last year, gave it a trial run. You know, we, it's a fitness component to it, but also a, a, a weekly group gathering a congregation. So we're about to reboot it shortly. We're kind of like now putting some literature around it, trying to make it a bit more robust. Um, so um, that's when you talk about the need for networks, that's one that we're currently um, doing. And I'm working with a few brothers from across the country because uh, online wow. gives us the ability, you know, to have broader networks to serve our, our community. Um, yeah. The second, the second question, second, I guess the last question I have for you just deals with the mental health health crisis with black men right, that we see right now. You know, you look across the country, the overwhelming face of homelessness is black and male, um, and you look at some of these incidents that we see playing out on the news. It bespeaks um, mental health crisis. Um, there was one last week. You know, a, a brother uh, got on live and killed his children's mother. Uh, laid out his clothes for the funeral on the bed, told the cops they could take the children, and then he took his own life. But these incidents are not one off. And once upon a time, when you heard certain incidents, you could say, oh, we know it wasn't someone Black who did it. But now where we are, you know, in late stage capitalism, existing in a crumbled, crumbling empire where Black men are alienated and isolated as never before, the mental health crisis is significant right now. Um, so I guess I would ask you as a, as a black male studies scholar, what are some things that we can do, assuming we don't get the support um, policy wise from the state, what are some things that we can do on our own internally to start to address this crisis? I think of course, uh, when it comes to incidents like the uh, like the brother that you described or when it comes to suicide or the sources of a lot of mental health uh, anxiety among black males, socioeconomic is, is a big factor, socioeconomic factors. So 
it's hard to disentangle black males mental health from their economic status their opportunities their employment yeah etc because that's so closely associated with manhood in 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 so many ways the other i think relates to these networks like the network that you all that you all have together that in and of itself i think is a tool because it can allow for black males to come together to express themselves in a in a supported setting and a lot of times uh, black males don't have that and and don't perceive or don't perceive that they have that because one of the chief causes of self harm among black males is the inappropriate or or um, harmful internalizing of negative negative emotions, yeah. negative feelings, mm-hmm. or they they judge themselves har- harshly because society teaches them to direct their their ang- their anxiety inward, even though we're stereotyped as externalizers. You know, mm-hmm. we hurt people, we get violent, etc you know majority of black males are the who who commit self-harm they're internalizing they internalize emotion negatively and they're expected to suppress their emotion then criticized for not expressing it enough you know <laughs> so there are these contradictory expectations about uh, for for black males and it leads to that to a lot of confusion on the one hand you, you can't have unrestrained, you know, not not enough emotional control because that leads to acting out and in harmful ways. Then you can't have too much um, suppression of emotion, you know, because of the anxiety that cause causes. But what we need, once again, I think is the kinds of things that you that you are part of that creates um, a network of men that black males can go to that, that affirm their their identity, not just as black, but also as male. The other thing I think that it, that's important for black males is um, there's something called, we know post-traumatic stress disorder and a lot of black males experience it, um, but also there's post-traumatic growth. Mm. You know, there's, a, there's a, a model of post-traumatic growth that's been applied to black males to help black males to number one, when you experience misandry, you experience uh, who does very, who does scholarship on this? Uh, Post traumatic growth. Yeah, there's a couple of scholars out of Auburn that do it um, post traumatic and and have done it uh, applied to black males. Okay, and it yeah, there's several people have used it have applied the model. Okay, but um, when it when it for black males particularly, I mean, looking at experiences that they've had and being able to take time to deconstruct them to understand why you experience this what this is um to to think about like when you experience these kind of things what strength can you gain from them? like how can what does this teach you about what you're up against what does it teach you how does it help you to be to empathize with other males with other black males how does it teach you how can you integrate that into developing programs like the kinds that you do Mm-hmm. You know, how can you take that that you experience and turn it around and use it as a tool? And then the last part of it is constructing a network around you, around you, you know, which I think a lot of brothers are doing these days. And um, I'm hearing about a lot of great programs like, I mean, when you say war college, that's I'm excited. <laughs> that's exciting to me, you know, yeah. I hear about that, that going on. I mean, that's important. The other thing is, I think, black male um, psychologists. In more investment in uh, the Association of Black Psychology, you know, more black people to to pay attention to what's coming out of the Association of Black Psychology, but also more black male psychologists, because a lot of the ways that that males, males express depression, they don't always exhibit the same way as their female counterparts do. Yeah. You know, a a lot of times that, you know, whereas you, you find all people, oh, you know, may overeat or undereat when it comes to depression. Males, however, compared to females, they're more likely to skip meals than to overeat. You know, they 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 um, they ex- exhibit they they're less likely to verbally 
say I am de- depressed, they're more likely to keep it keep it to themselves and and express an irritable mood or a disinterest in in what they're typically passionate about. So there are things that males do, generally speaking, differently than females. E- even though we all exhibit these, there's there are certain things that males do more or less yeah. when they experience depression and when you're not aware of that, like when there's not enough research on it, how black males demonstrate spread, uh, uh, stress and anxiety, then how are you, how do you expect to treat it? You know, how do you expect to address it? So the research community needs to play a big part in it as well. Um, and I think that those are just kind of like a start. All right, bro. Listen, I appreciate that. Hold on one second. I appreciate that. You know, I, 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 I try to have these conversations. My, my goal, you know, I, I mean, I, I think of when people are on their commute, if you have a, a long commute from work, I try to provide them with a conversation where they could listen to this entire conversation on a ride home and feel like it was um, relaxing, enjoyable, like they learned something as well i'm all, I'm always thinking about that so I, you know i appreciate you pulling up today to have uh have the conversation um and i'm looking forward to, to to having you back we might have to get you over to give us a presentation in the war college so we'll we'll talk about that uh, off, right. offline for sure but in any closing remarks you want to leave with the family before before we tap out yeah i just would say i think um what what Brother Africa mentioned today about doing those oral, those those family oral histories, is important for all of us um, to to do. And I also would say that when it comes to Black family, just take another second to look at things holistically. Like look at the other side of things. Like look at the look at alternative views. And um, and taking the time to do that, I think, is a, a reward. Because right now, like, if there's so much excitement about certain things about black men, like, um, like someone will, no doubt, if I'm if I'm on a, uh, if, if I'm somewhere and in in talking about black males, someone will want me to, to address address rape, address uh, black on black violence that black males commit. Um. There's nothing wrong with that. Those are important things to address. But I'm hoping for the day that someone also says, well, I also want to hear about those methods of healing that work, that show, that, that prove effective with, with Black males who are, who are like uh, experiencing anxiety or mental health. What about people who have uh, a proven... Uh, guaranteed methods of increasing black boys literacy rates, you know, like who, who's excited, who's excited to hear that, you know what yeah, I mean? Those yeah. are the, I wish we had that. I want us to have that balance. And I think, I think most people actually do have that desire for, to hear those kind of things. They just, the appetite has been created to hear certain things about black males and, and, and not others. There's a brother by the name of uh, Alfred Tatum, has a method of teaching black boys literacy, raising black males literacy. He should be on every, he should, he should be celebrated throughout the country. You know, the man is, he has a method of, of raising black boys literacy rates. Um, I want to try to get him on. You know, and you hear people now, let's have, let's have that conversation. You know, let's have both. both. Let's also talk about those kind of things. And I think we have to to have conversations like the ones that you like these questions that you're asking me about. And I'm going to learn from you because, I, you know, you're going to send me you, you say you're going to send me the information about the indigenous uh, conversations. And but like if we hear the we have these conversations, do you, like, do you, have, you, do you have high blood pressure? No, I don't. OK, cool. I was going to say, because if you do, I might not send them to you. Oh, <laughs> you know, I I just think that if we had we keep having these conversations, I think it will peak people's diversify people's appetites for what they want to know. Mm-hmm. Like we have to we have to want to know more things about ourselves than the kinds of things that are popular right now. Yeah, you know, and that's I think that's the that's the biggest thing. 
All right. Well, listen, Dr. Dr. Sarah McDougal. All right, family, you already know what to do. Uh, really quick, if this is your first time here. Yo, check this out. Run my uncle Moel his likes. Make sure y'all hit the like button. And this is your first time on the channel. Go ahead and subscribe. I appreciate y'all pulling up. We out. Peace. Thank you. Going off topic. Off topic. You really off topic right now. Yo, you way off topic. How is it that everybody's over here and you way over there off topic?